Thank you. I'd like to call this meeting to order. This is a special meeting of the Heritage and Landmark Commission to consider application HLC 2101, which is for alterations to the historic Canby City Hall. Thank you all for being here tonight. The matter presented before the hearing body requires a public hearing. All interested persons in attendance shall be heard on the matter. If you wish to testify on this matter, please fill out the public testimony card and give it to the recording secretary. All appropriate, at the appropriate time, when your name is called, please step forward to the microphone, state your name, address, and interest in the matter. For longer presentations, proponents and opponents may buy time from one another. I don't see that as a need tonight. Uh, in doing so, either in favor of or opposed, may allocate their time to a spokesperson who will represent the entire group. Uh, oftentimes of meetings like this, there are time limits that are, that are proposed, but we have a small group tonight, so I'm not imposing any time limits on anyone that wishes to speak. Uh, all questions must be directed through me, the chair. Any evidence must be, to be considered must be submitted to the hearing body for public access and to become part of the record. All written testimony received both for and against prior to the hearing shall be summarized by staff and presented briefly to the hearing body during the staff report. Testimony and evidence must be directed toward the applicable review criteria contained as indicated in the staff report, the comprehensive plan or the application, the applicable land use regulations which the person believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accommodated by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an, a, an opportunity to respond to the issue may preclude a plea, appeal to the land use board of appeals based on that issue. Failure of the applicant to raise constitutional or other issues relating to proposed conditions of approval with sufficient specificity to allow the local government to respond to the issue may preclude an action for damages in circuit court. Everyone present is encouraged to testify, even if it's only to concur with previous testimony. All right, at this time, I'd like to ask if any members of this hearing body, uh, if anyone who might have conflict of interest to please indicate the, ex the nature and the extent of the conflict and whether you intend to participate in or abstain from hearing the present matter. Anyone? No? All right. Ex parte, also any member of the hearing body who has had any ex parte contact with anyone prior to this hearing, including a visit to the site, please declare the nature and extent of such contact at this time. And I will call out that I have had ex parte communications, but the nature of it is was uh, not related to this specific topic. I did meet with several individuals of the planning of the Canby Beautification Committee and Mary Hanlon on the site to talk about other beautification efforts. So planting a tree is an example. And we briefly discussed the timing of this meeting and potential timing of having a celebration of uh, planting a tree and, um, and uh, a, a time capsule, but that was the extent of the conversation. And so I don't think that that affects my partiality at all. I'm very impartial. Just wanted to put that on record. Uh, does any member of the audience have any questions for any of the commissioners regarding to conflict of interest or ex parte communication? Nope. Okay. Then uh, what I'd like to do then is um, start with the, the staff report and I want to thank you Don and your staff for preparing a very thorough and detailed report and also providing it in a timely manner so all of us had time for very careful consideration so we're ready for your presentation please. Good evening, Commission, uh, Chair um, Garoche and Commissioners. Um, I'm Don Hardy. I'm here with Eric Forcell. Um, we're glad to be here tonight, and I'm glad that information was helpful for you. Before I get started, I wanted to also um, let you know that Stephen um, Elbeck from Sarah Architects will be here to answer very specific questions, and his presentation is at the end of our presentation. There will be some overlap between our presentation and his presentation, so I'm going to try to not keep you here all night um, by going through a lot of detail. So in some cases uh, on the staff report, I'll be abbreviating that since Stephen will be covering those issues. Um, so before you tonight, um, we're uh, here for the historic city hall. 
and the applicant is seeking approval to complete adaptive reuse alternatives. He's seeking Heritage and Landmarks Commission approval, specifically a certificate of appropriateness. Um, and there's a few steps that we called out here that um, once the certificate of appropriateness is approved, assuming the hearing tonight this, this is an approval, there would be a subsequent city site plan review process, also a Clackamas County building permit process that's required. Um, there is a desire by the applicant to use the property for food oriented uses, which is permitted in the downtown commercial zone. So the Historic Landmarks uh, Commission has the, um, is empowered really to uh, make the decision tonight on the certificate of appropriateness and the approval of this application. Uh, this is a major modification application pursuant to 16.110 of our code, which is the historic um, preservation part of our code. And the city of Canby is <clears throat> participating in, um, in the review of local historic resources as certified by the State Historic Preservation Office, SHPO. Um, this became necessary after exterior remodeling of the building occurred without city and county review and approval. And as I mentioned, uh, that's a major alteration. Um, the remedy to that is, is the process we're going through tonight. And uh, there's 12 criteria that are specific to the certificate of appropriateness. Uh, the applicant is also listed in the, his application submittal 15 proposed project elements, which he will go through in more detail later in the presentation. <clears throat> so there are several sections of the code that um, relate to this application, the downtown commercial zone, 1622, historical protection overlay, 1638, downtown can be overlay zone, 1641. Uh, an application and review procedure, 1689, and historic preservation, 16110. Existing conditions, uh, you can see the site is at 182 North Holly Street. Um, uh, Holly abuts on the west and sec Northwest 2nd Avenue on the, on the north. Um, zone C1, as I mentioned, and there's two overlays, downtown commercial overlay and historic protection overlay. This is a condition prior to the alteration, uh, the most recent alter alteration to the site, and this is the existing condition now. There's a number, these are the 15 elements that are, that are identified here. I, I will let the um, applicant speak to those in more specific, but I'll give a pause here just for a moment to go through these, and, um, but it'll be rather rapid. So Eric, you wanna go to the next slide? And we can go back to these as well as, as needed, but uh, the applicant also has this in his presentation. And the next one. And so one of the call outs here that I did want to go back to is, um, go back a slide, Eric. One more slide. Um, actually back one. Um, keep going one more forward, sorry. Um, Okay, um, the top two bullet points, sorry about that. The top two bullet points, I just wanted to call out that there is a memorial flagpole on the site that the applicant would like to relocate. Um, that is a dedicated uh, Veterans of Foreign War. Um, there's a plaque on that uh, flagpole. And I do have a condition of approval related to that, um, which would mean, mean that Veterans of Foreign War would have to agree to the relocation of that. There is a possibility that could go to the Maple Street Park and the Parks Department lead, um, Jeff Snyder, have coordinated with him. That's gonna be something that would end up being uh, reviewed uh, subsequent to this application tonight, the approval, but that would need to be uh, approved through that process of, of vetting that with them. There's also an existing park bench and that's um, really more of a city issue. Uh, again, that would be a coordination with the Parks Department for that. So those are the only two items I really wanted to point out in the 15 items. Thank you. This is the proposed alteration rendering, and there'll be more discussion about this later, but you can see the bay doors that are on the right-hand side that uh, will be somewhat of a focus tonight on your review. And this is with landscaping. Uh, these are the elevations, uh, north elevation before and after, west elevation before and after, and I'll let the applicant speak to the details. Um, he has a much better breakdown. You can see better, these are really microscopic on this scale, so you'll be able to see those. Uh, before east elevation, after east elevation, before south elevation, after south elevation. Again, more detail to come. 
So diving into the code as to kind of how we navigate through the process to um, look at the standards in the city code again, um, looking at downtown commercial zone, historic protection overlay zone, and downtown can be overlay zone and um, applicable review procedures. So the first one is that this is in the downtown commercial zone and underlying base zone is C1 that does permit food oriented uses. It's also in the historical protection overlay zone which segues into the authorization of the project uh, being reviewed in the historic preservation chapter of 16110 which empowers the um, historic, the heritage and um, uh, the the um, Heritage and Landmarks Commission, Commission to approve the project. It's also in the downtown can be overlay zone, but uh, that zone does not apply to this property because it's subject to the historical preservation chapter specifically that addresses preservation. It supersedes that chapter. Uh, the application process 1689, it's a type three application process subject to appeal hearing and Landmarks Commission review process and the noticing of this hearing has been appropriately done. Uh, historic preservation uh, process um, calls out uh, that this would be a major alteration and there's a certificate, certificate of appropriateness as I mentioned before, those standards will start to get into next. And these are the standards which the applicant will also mirror in his presentation. So I won't go through these individually since I'll let Stephen go through them. But just again, just to note them. And so those are those. Are those. And so that leads us to um, our review of staff. And uh, we are recommending approval for this with the following conditions. Um, a certificate of appropriateness would be issued and the applicant would follow those conditions. That prior to commencement of construction, site plan review approval from the city and also uh, Clackamas County building permit be uh, authorized. The applicant provide a certificate of appropriateness to Clackamas County building division. Uh, and then all required county building permits shall be submitted to and approved prior to the commencement of construction activities. For the flagpole, as I mentioned, uh, that and the bench, those are coordination items that the applicant will need to do with. They can be Aurora Veterans Foreign War Post 6057 in the city of Canby. The bench is really a subject of the city of Canby authorization, but the flagpole will need to go through that process of coordinating with uh, Veterans of Foreign War. And then our final condition, which is any substantial deviation to the plans approved by the Heritage and Landmarks Commission may require further review. Uh, this may include additional hearings or other reviews subject to the discretion of the planning director. Um, a letter was received from Carol Palmer in support of the project, and um, we've provided that to you. Uh, uh, also, um, we've received no additional comments uh, for the application. So um, I wanted to, based on all of the uh, application that's been submitted by the applicant, we're recommending approval and we have provided as well uh, draft findings that were also part of the packet that um, include uh, findings we'd, and we would like, um, we would recommend that um, those findings be approved along with the underlying application tonight. Uh, we can bring those up on our screen uh, to go through those in detail. but. Uh, we wanted to um, call those out. We want to make sure that we have those um, appropriately identified and supported or modified as you see fit uh, before the end of the hearing. So with that, I am um, glad to ask, answer any questions that you may have. Anyone have any questions about the staff report? Apparently not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for giving us this opportunity tonight. My name is Stephen Elda. I'm with Sarah Architects. I'm the applicant for the Certificate of Appropriateness on behalf of the owner tonight. 
Uh, what I'd like to do, if it uh, works for you, is to give you a little bit of the history of the building, uh, describe what our proposed alterations are, uh, and then go through the criteria for major alterations that Don uh, alluded to. Uh, that sounds well. I'll go ahead and get started. So. Uh, by way of some uh, history and background for the, the property, um, the building was uh, originally constructed in 1936-1937 as part of the PWA um, initiative during the Depression era. And, uh, and I should also acknowledge that Carol Palmer's excellent scholarship on this building has greatly informed what you're about to hear. Um, that original uh, building was um, highly regarded as a, a, an example of the, the work of that uh, program that the PWA did. And uh, the characteristic features from that first phase of work are the, the brick rectangular mass that's the city hall with that steeply sloped roof and the couple of dormers there, the, the distinctly punched uh, window openings, the setback entry door. Um, Offset from that is another rectangular mass uh, that was the uh, fire apparatus hall, and that has the, um, the uh, operable doors that you see in the right-hand side of the image, uh, glazed on top, paneled down below. Uh, there's a uh, 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 pose drying tower uh, in the southeast corner of the site, and there's also a little projection for the jail that were all part of that original 1936-37 uh, work. Uh, in the uh, uh, early 1960s, the library or the uh, fire station was constructed and the fire apparatus bay was no longer needed and the library uh, was proposed to occupy that space. And so there was an adaptive reuse at that time, which um, involved, as you can see in the image, removing the apparatus bay doors and constructing a new entry that was more suitable to the library use. And so it has that uh, steeply sloped roof, tucked tightly underneath of the eaves. It's got the white uh, clabbered or whiteboard uh, siding with a recessed door and the horizontally uh, uh, oriented windows. There was also a new council chamber constructed off to the southeast end of the site uh, that's not visible in this particular image. In the 1980s, there was another alteration that happened to this primary uh, west facade of the building, which was the construction of some new steps and a ramp to uh, comply with the recently adopted Americans with Disabilities Act. At that time, the historic front door appears to have been removed and replaced with a steel uh, half-light door. Uh, in 2017, the next uh, major modification to the property occurred with the uh, demolition of the council chamber off the southeast corner of the building. And it was noted at the time that that was approved as it um, helped to restore the reading of the original 1936-37 PWA uh, effort. There were some other modifications that we've observed. We don't have the specific dates on them, but I'll make note of them here. Most of the wood windows on the building have been previously demolished and, re and vinyl replacement units were installed. The landscape around the site has been significantly altered and um, one of the uh, flagpoles was removed from the site. Now we get to the fun part. We get to try to help you visualize all these various things that we're <laughs> proposing to do. So um, I'm going to try to walk you through the plan where we have the dots that are coded to the descriptions on the side. Give you some uh, background on those. Some of those things are going to be better explained in some elevations, so we're going to look at those as well. So working from the top down, you can see item number one, which I think the thing we're probably going to spend more time talking about than a lot of the other things, is the, remo the proposed removal. Uh, of the engine bay doors and the installation of swinging uh, doors back into the masonry frame. Uh, item two, you see several of those around the perimeter of the building. Uh, that's calling out the proposed removal of the existing vinyl replacement windows and installation of wood divided light windows of a compatible uh, pattern and, and material. Item three is the request to replace the existing steel front door with a paneled wood door. That would be consistent and compatible with the original uh, documentation for that door. Item four is in the southeast corner of the site. North is to the left, southeast is the top of the page. 
so item four is a request to replace the existing non-original steel door that's at the rear of the site of the engine bay uh, hall. Uh, this door is not original to the 1936 era building. I think it's related to the construction of the council chamber and creating an internal connection to the building. Item five uh, is the center uh, of the, the plan on the top side there. This is a request to remove one existing vinyl replacement window and modify the masonry opening uh, by cutting it down to install, and then cutting it down to install an egress door, uh, part of a code required uh, modification associated with this uh, use. As that window is currently over a daylight access well, or a basement access well, we would construct a landing over that, which is oriented in the same direction as the basement access well, uh, so that uh, people, when they exit the building, can get back to grade. Uh, point six and seven relate to the food, the proposed uh, food service use. So those are noted at the top. Item six is the construction of a dormer to uh, contain a, a uh, makeup air unit to work, go to the kitchen equipment. And item seven is an uh, installation of two proposed exhaust vents in the side wall there at the east. Item eight is a request to replace the existing front steps. They're showing signs of deterioration and the handrails don't conform to the current code. So we would be looking to um, replace those steps modify them uh, slightly, as you see on the diagram, in addition to the, uh, the ramp and the primary stairs is the stairs off to the side, which go to a small seating area. Uh, Don's already mentioned item nine about the flagpole related to the veterans of foreign wars, but there's a request to, to relocate that off-site. 10, uh, it ties to the comment around the public bench that's in the uh, city sidewalk right away. Uh, we were proposing to um, construct some short concrete planters around the perimeter of the site, which provided that landscape buffer you saw in the earlier image, but also provided seating area for the restaurants, uh, the food service uses. Um, Item 11 in our request in this next group of items we think are, are typically maintenance items, but we want you to understand the full impact of what we're proposing to do. Item 11 is to restore the three existing dormers on the roof. You see the two barrel dormers called out in this photograph. There's a shed dormer on the east side of the building as well that would be restored. Item 12 is to paint the ex exterior soffits and gutters. Uh, similarly, item 13 is to paint the stucco walls of the south uh, east side and, as well, and the hose drying tower. Item 14 is to work with the postal service to relocate that mail drop box. And item 15 would be to replace the um, heat pumps that are at the southeast corner of the site in that alley space um, with, more, with uh, more energy efficient units. Uh, I understand that some of those uh, descriptions may not be best understood in plans, so we've taken a couple of them to the elevation to try to help you understand what our proposed work is. Here you see the uh, primary west elevation uh, before and after. On the right-hand side, we've put the, uh, the red bubbles around the things that we think are probably of most interest to this uh, commission. The Right-hand bubble is those apparatus uh, doors, and so you see there the proposal is to remove the uh, infill projecting bay that was associated with the library work to restore the masonry opening and to install new operable doors into that opening. At the center of the building, the second red bubble on the right-hand drawing is showing the, uh, the proposed eight-panel door that would be more consistent with the historic uh, uh, installation. Uh, on the east elevation, we're also proposing some alterations that impact the elevation. You see them called out here again. Um, on the left-hand side of the after image, you see bubbles around the proposed uh, me uh, mechanical openings related to the food service use. So on the bottom left, you see the two exhaust uh, grills at the center, just above that to the right, proposed shed dormer with the intake louvers. The farthest right bubble is describing that proposed removal of the um, vinyl replacement window. 
cutting down the masonry opening to install an egress door and then that landing over the basement access well that discharges off to the north. Uh, it might be interesting to note that the window that's immediately to the left of the proposed door uh, is the uh, one surviving wood window. We think that goes back to the original building. I might pause there, catch my breath, and ask if you have any questions about those before we launch into reviewing the alteration criteria. Okay. So uh, what I'd like to do here is I'm going to, just going to read the alteration criteria and then talk a little bit about our strategies around how we think we've met that criteria. So this first criteria, a property shall be used for its historic purpose or be placed in a new use that requires minimal change to the defining characteristics of the building and its site and environment. Well, so uh, City Hall, the fire department, and the library have all found wonderful new spaces. So we're going to propose using it for something new. And that's going to be a uh, food service, uh, food oriented business. Um, <clears throat> that change of use, we think, does not require uh, major or or changes to the primary massing of the building, which we think is one of the important defining characteristics of the the 1936 building, and you're going to hear me say this quite a bit. We're really focusing on that pre-1961 period of the building. It's the period of significance, the 1936 to 37 design. So we think that the one um, relatively significant alteration that we're proposing relative to that, the removal of the apparatus, uh, the projection of the apparatus bay door and reinstalling them actually helps to support getting back to that um, characteristic period of the of significance. The next criteria, historic character of a property shall be retained and preserved the removal of distinctive materials or alterations of features and spaces and special relationships that characterize the property shall be avoided. Um, so some of our proposed, some of the conditions of our proposed use will require some alterations and those are to address life safety and accessibility principally. Where we are making those alterations, we are doing our best to put them onto the secondary facades of the building and investing our efforts in trying to um, bring up the primary elevations, Holly Street and Second Avenue, as, they, um, as we work towards reinforcing that essential character of the 36-37 the period, period of significance. So here you see the, the two uh, conditions, the one on the left, the original design with the, the, the apparatus bay doors. To the right with the, uh, the infill we're proposing, or we think you can appreciate that the, um, the, the infill on the right hand image really crowds up underneath the eave line. Um, it uh, overrides the read of the masonry opening and the orientation of the windows are all some things that are a little bit at, at odds with the original design. We really appreciate that original design, so we're proposing to, like I said, go back in with swing doors. Uh, here you're seeing us uh, change the percentage of glazing in those to support the, the modern business and giving people visual access to it, but going back with a paneled door of a similar character as original. Again, a little bit larger, so a little bit easier to see, but we've talked about many of these items already in terms of the modifications on the left side for the food service and the, the modifications for the egress. The next uh, criteria, each property shall be recognized as a physical record of its time, place, and use. Changes that create a false sense of historical development, such as adding conjectural features or architectural elements from other historic properties shall not be undertaken. Start by saying that where maintenance is required and original material is present, um, restoration will always be the preferred action. Um, where we are making alterations, um, we're using intact details of the building, period photographs, original drawings, all as the basis of our decisions. And so that means that with the new and the replacement elements like the doors and the windows, um, we're, look, we're gonna be compatible and looking back towards the, the PWA era design. But we do have strategies to make sure that the work is also distinguishable as contemporary work. And we'll talk about that in one of the, the upcoming criteria. The next criteria, most properties change over time. Those changes that have acquired historic significance in their own right shall be retained and preserved. It's wide recognition that the, um, the, the pre-1961 configuration is the primary historical resource. 
Um, the uh, nomination to the local landmarks uh, status does mention the infill associated with the library having achieved as its own level of significance, um, mostly by virtue of its date of construction, its civic purpose, and its familiarity to the public, but not necessarily being an equivalent architectural achievement. And so um, we also, uh, again, note that uh, contemporaneous additions as that as the infill at the apparatus stores the council chamber specifically been previously approved for demolition uh, is it supported the overall goal of getting back to that, that uh, core 1936-37 building. Uh, that's criteria, next criteria here. Uh, distinctive features, finishes and construction techniques are examples of craftsmanship that characterize a historic property shall be preserved. So um, we're not proposing any additions that would compete with that characteristic massing of the brick base with the steeply, stope, steeply sloped roof. And we're not um, proposing any large scale demolitions to the structure aside from what we've talked about at the apparatus door. Um, we think that that removal does in fact help us get back to, to the more distinctive elements of the project. And so we're, and we'll typically be preserving those historic features and finishes. Um, we are pushing those modifications we talked about earlier to the east side, which is the non-public side, it's the secondary facade, so that where we do have to make modifications to meet the current use and code, they're not competing with the primary read of the building. Here you see the doors relative uh, to the masonry opening when the old apparatus room was there uh, compared to the, um, the infill. Again, we favor the... Um, the doors of the apparatus bay is being more consistent with the overall composition of the earlier building. Uh, so getting back to that clearly articulated masonry opening with the doors in it we think is, the, is in the best interest of the property. And you've seen that. The next criteria, deteriorated historic features shall be repaired rather than replaced. Where the severity of the deterioration requires replacement of a distinctive feature, the new feature shall match the old in design, color, texture, and other visual qualities and, where possible, materials. Replacement of missing features shall be substantiated by documentary, physical, or pictorial evidence. There are several locations which we articulate here where there is original intact material which we'll be working to preserve. That includes the one window on the east side that we talked about. When they install the vinyl replacement windows, they typically preserve the wood casings, and so we'll be, we'll be keeping those. The brick chimney, the dormers are all part of the city hall section of the original fabric. The steel door and the two steel framed windows in the jail section will remain and get, um, and, and get restored. And the wooden louvers and the hose drying tower are all uh, historic detail that's being preserved. Additionally, the brick and stucco walls as well as the various wood elements will, are typically in good condition and will get cleaned and preserved. We typically think that should replacement be required, um, the details and materials would support the use of in-kind uh, repair and replacement. Criteria G, uh, chemical or physical treatments such as sandblasting that cause damage to materials shall not be used. The surface cleaning of structures, if appropriate, shall be undertaken using the least damaging or gentlest means possible. So we're not proposing any sandblasting or harsh chemical treatments as part of the, the cleaning processes. Uh, we'll generally use um, the gentlest process possible to prepare the surface for its final finish uh, and use lead safe practices where appropriate. Uh, water wash uh, for brick and, and stucco is appropriate. Next criteria, significant archeological resources affected by a project shall be protected and preserved. If such resources must be disturbed, mitigation measures shall be undertaken. It's not expected that the work will undercover or disturb any significant archeological resources, but should that occur, we would stop work and develop a mitigation plan. Next criteria, new additions, exterior alterations, or related new construction shall not destroy historic materials that characterize the property. The new work shall be differentiated from the old and shall be compatible with the massing size scale and architectural features to protect the historic integrity of the property and its environment. 
we're not proposing to construct any new occupiable space with this work, and um, we've taken, we think, uh, um, great care to make sure that any of the modifications that are required by the code or the proposed use are pushed off to the secondary elevations to the interior corner of the site and where they're less um, visible to the public. We are also making sure that the new work is differentiated uh, while remaining compatible and some of the strategies we have around that. The replacement windows um, would be of a similar pattern and profile, um, but on close inspection you would note that they're using insulated glazing uh, for the glass. Uh, we're referencing the original construction drawings and vintage photos when selecting our new panel door at the main entry, and then we're using that as a reference for some of the other door replacements um, so that the overall project keeps that compatibility. We talked a little bit about modifying that window on the east side to address the, um, the egress. Um, we would detail that landing so that it completely encapsulates the basement access stair so it's still there uh, as a resource at a future date. And um, another differentiation strategy would be, to, though, we're locating the makeup air uh, in a new um, shed dormer on the east side. Uh, referencing the details from the existing shed dormer, we'd be using an aluminum louver so you could differentiate the new work from the old. The next criteria, new additions and, ad uh, and adjacent or related new construction shall be undertaken in such a manner that if removed in the future the essential form and integrity of the historic property, including the historic plant materials and its environment would be unimpaired. So what I, the one additive alteration that I might say we're doing is that, that makeup air dormer and it has very minimal structural impact and can easily be removed in the future should the building change use that doesn't require that. Um, similar uh, approach would be taken with that landing over the basement egress stair uh, on the east side. We we'll also uh, talked briefly at the beginning about the desire to construct these low planter walls to help define the perimeter of the site and set off the restaurant seating area. And so those do not engage the building wall itself, but they are referencing um, uh, short uh, site walls associated with those basement access stairs, both their material and their height and proportion. And so we also think that most of the proposed interventions we're doing are um, working to remove some of the less sensitive modern renovations and improve some previous maintenance efforts. So. Next criteria, the location and orientation of the new structure on the site is consistent with the typical location and orientation of similar structures on the site or within the district or corridor, considering setbacks, distances between structures, location of entrances, and similar siting considerations. So we're not building a new structure, so this one's not applicable to our proposal. The next criteria changes to yard areas, including planters, fences, and ponds, walkways, and landscape materials should be compatible with the overall historic setting. Uh, the historic landscape was demolished many years ago, uh, so we think this one's not applicable to our proposal as well. So uh, with that, I'll say thank you. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you very much. That was very helpful. Thank you. Appreciate that. Does anyone on the group have a question? No questions? Yes? They push this yeah. No, you're fine. Okay. Uh, just a quick question. Um, I was curious if there was any signage uh, planned for the building, and if so, um, if you have font plans, if it's going to reflect the era or not. So it's a little hard for me to hear you, but I think the question was around signage. Yes, if you have any proposed signage uh, for the building. So we're uh, still negotiating with the proposed tenant, so we don't have a specific signage proposal to bring today. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? I have a couple of questions. I mean, this is a fairly new process to me, so um, the approach I took is when I looked at the report, which was very well done, thank you. I, I'm a technical person, so I just did a word search in PDF, in the PDF document to see if it was answering my questions, and there are just a couple minor things. There was a mention about uh, painting, which of course, you know, the stucco area, which of course it needs, but I didn't see a mention of the color of the paint. We haven't made a final selection of the color yet, uh, but the intention would be to stay with those off-white uh, off family okay, colors. Okay, awaiting a final decision. Okay. 
Uh, and then uh, another question which um, I believe I saw in a rendering, but I just want to double check. So the, the, the windows for the jail area, the external windows, have bars on them. Mm -hmm. And will those be retained, the yes. bars? Okay. And it looked like that from the rendering, so thank you. And then just a question out of interest. I, I know that there is a proposal to um, remove a window and, and make a door there for additional egress, which makes sense. I'm just curious, what happens to the old brickwork that is taken out from that process? Uh, so um, some of the bricks will be cut as part of cutting the opening down, and that. then you can try to salvage some of the bricks that are in the field below the sill. Uh, we've successfully done this uh, approach at wa Washington High School in oh. Portland. If you've gone to a concert at Revolution Hall, all of the ground floor entrances, we use this technique. What happens to the brickwork? To the remaining brickwork? Mm -hmm. or, or, no, so, the brickwork that's removed. Oh, uh, so that particular uh, owner chose not to um, salvage the brick, so it was just recycled. Okay, so it's up to the owner, basically, yeah. which makes sense. Okay, I was just curious. Thank you very much. Ron, yes? Yeah, um, she was talking about the signage. Where would the signage be on the building itself? But we want to work with the, the proposed tenant. The two locations that we've seen signage uh, are over the front door and over the apparatus bay doors. So those would be a couple of candidate locations. We've also talked about a monument sign someplace uh, out in the, the planting area so that there's nothing on the building. Very good, thank you. Any other questions? All right, so at this point, then, we can open the hearing for public testimony if there are any opponents, proponents, or neutral parties who wish to speak. Yes, Carol. I wasn't sure where the comment card. I know. <laughs> I'm holding on to it. Thank you. I think I'm supposed to give it to you. Oh, are you? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. <laughs> So I don't want to extend your night, so I'm not going to reread what I, you folks have already read, but I just wanted to come here to say that I really do support this application and also to answer any questions that you might have of what I submitted. Um, the one other comment I have to make, and this just exposes the fact that I'm a history nerd, is that um, that East Annex actually was not originally meant to be a city council chamber. Yeah. The East Annex that has been destroyed was actually an apparatus room for the equipment was still remaining on the, the before they did the, the um, bust out of the wall and put in the, the projecting infill. There was still some equipment left on this side of 99E in that site. And so what they wanted to do was make sure that there was a site on both sides of 99E, because oh. the new fire uh, house had already been built on Grant Street. So anyway, um, at some time later, all the equipment left, and then the city council got shoved out there. So um, that was just my history nerd part. Um, so any questions? I think we've learned a lot, Carol. Thank you yeah. and from all Great. of you. Thank you very much. Appreciate you bet. that. Okay, so this concludes the public hearing portion. And um, if there are any other questions from the commission list? Yes. Uh, do you happen to have a picture of how the building was before and the proposed? How the building was before, I'm sorry. How, how is, how is, how the, how you proposed the build? the building to be and how it was previously. Well, do you mean a rendering or a picture? Sense. It'd have to be a rendering for yeah, the proposal. Um, so we have the rendering of this elevation, which um, without the, there's an image here without the landscape in front of it. Okay. That's how it was before. No, this is our proposal to it. Um, we are generally going back to the um, the massing and the patterns of openings that were a part of the, the work before 1961. So the white would be... 
see the white I... part of it, like the garage door would be. Uh, so on the on the right hand side where the apparatus bay doors are, the it's a wood panel door. So it's got it's a, a two thirds glazed, one third wood panel composition, and there are three pairs of them that would go back into that masonry opening. And how it was before was it was a door. So it was similarly a, a group of three paired doors as it presented to the exterior. It appears that they were actually hinged sliding doors, the way that the uh, hinging was working. Because of our particular use along with code requirements, we're proposing three pairs of double doors to recreate a similar feel within that masonry opening. question for you, Stephen. Can you explain for us um, the reasoning for, uh, from going from the one-third light uh, to the two-third and how that relates to the use, the sure. suggested use? Yeah. Um, so the, two, the, the historic one-third light is very high, as you can tell by the, the gentleman standing in here. And, and a contemporary business is going to want both a lot more daylight in it as well as more line of sight into it. Uh, so that's informing our our request mm. to switch the proportions uh, so that it can be a, both more viable and attractive business. Uh, is it thought that those would be open during business hours when the weather is permitting, which is rare? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the the tenant is uh, expressed interest in having that open and have, yeah. Okay. Now, would that annex part be for dining or the kitchen? So actually, the proposal is to have two different businesses here, so they each have the sort of function of uh, their own front doors. The the annex, the center pair, would be the primary entry into the proposed um, food operation that's there. And then the, uh, the historic main elevated front door would be the entry into the proposed business that's there. Any other questions, anyone? All right, uh, so then this begins our decision deliberation and discussion section. So this is where I'll ask each of you to, if you have a comment or um, about your opinion or, or not. So I'll start with you, Rachel. I, I don't see any concerns from the, the layouts and the, the information provided. So. Thank you. Uh, I feel it was very informative. I think I'm pretty confident that they I had a good amount of information. Oh, great. I don't see any major red flags. Excellent. Thank you. Ron? Well, as long as the signage is not on the building, and I'm not sure the reason for the movement of the flagpole. Okay. And I would concur with you that uh, based on what I've read and uh, the comparisons I've done to the standard and the comparisons to the intent of the, the building and uh, the look and feel of the building uh, and how it relates to the area, I think it makes sense to me. Thank you for a good report. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, Stephen, I wanted to thank you for the detailed and thorough project summary. Mm -hmm. That was great. Um, very, very helpful. Um, I think you guys have put a lot of thought into this, and it shows. Um, I want to also um, hearken to Carol's uh, letter that she submitted. Um, and um, I want to reiterate a couple of things. Um, I'm totally in support of this. I think, I think it's a um, well-thought-out project. Um, Firstly, the, the alterations and the repairs that you're doing are adhering to the standards for treatment of historic properties very closely. Um, for example, the doors and windows are going to replicate the original look. Um, you're going to take those, that vinyl out uh, and put in wood um, and the six over six. Um, that's an example of it. Um, also, the garage doors, um, I, I think um, 
it's a really good rendering um, of what those can be. I think it's really close. And I understand the reason from going from the one-third to the two-third, um, I think, for this project. I mean, even though we're, we're trying to restore a historic building, we still have to think about the overall use and where it goes in the future. We can't just have a building that's um, not <coughs> going to sit, um, that's going to sit in the landscape and not be able to enjoy it. Um, at the same time, we try to harken back to what its original look was. Um, and then as far as the rear of the building goes, um, that's always a tough one because you've got to go with code. You need an egress back there. Um, the rear of the building, I think, is compatible, completely compatible with the style of materials that, um, that, that uh, you know, mirror that of the original construction. So um, at least the 36 to 37 construction. So um, I appreciate that. And I, I think um, uh, I support it. Thank you. Doug, you'll need to unmute if you your speaker mm -hmm. yeah. microphone. Yeah. There you go. Oh, there's more hard push. <laughs> it is. Um, I guess a question I should have asked is about the roof. When was that last? Um, what would you say, serviced? Uh, I actually don't know the vintage of the most recent installation of the, the roof. It looks okay. I don't it know looks. In, it seems to I be in relatively good condition. I haven't heard about any or anything like that. So. So I don't know. Um, kind of looking through this, I see the word demolish. That sounds a little harsh to me, but I don't know. That's just me. Yeah, her, she and I remember when this was when we, this was the um, focal point of the city, and um, when I was with Candy Fire, I knew that host tower by its first name. And I remember when we stored the 35 Ford and the 48 Ford. Um, gosh, that was in the mid-1970s. Oh, well. Yeah, I think it's all right. Okay, that's your conclusion. Thank I think you. it's all right. All right, good. That's helpful. Um, thank sure. you very much, all of you. So I'll entertain a motion to approve application um, HLC 2101. Chair, yes? Chair Garish, could I just add one more item just so that this um, is done in terms of one fell swoop? Uh, regarding back to the signage, so we're not having to go back through another process later mm -hmm. for that. Uh, specifically to the building, um, because I think attachment to the building is probably the primary focus of this discussion tonight versus the monument signage, um, which I think could be handled by the compliance with city signage standards. Mm -hmm. But if there's some way to um, also include some parameters for the signage in your decision tonight, uh, we will not need to go back through another minor process. Would not be a major process, I believe, but it could be a minor process, so we would not delay the applicant from um, completing their future work, if that's acceptable to the applicant. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'd like to make a motion. All right, thank you. Yes, please. Um, I would like to move that the Heritage and Landmark Commission approve application HLC 21-01 and issue a certificate of appropriateness with the six conditions of approval listed in section six, page 15 of the staff report. Second. second. Rachel Swanson, second. Thank you very much. Okay, well, that concludes tonight's meeting then. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much for the, the wonderful presentations, very helpful, and the, the very detailed reports. I, I really appreciated what I've learned and how much effort went into those. So thank you, everyone. Sounds like we're done. Yeah, done. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, thank you. In favor? Yay. 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 Everyone opposed? Anyone abstain? One. I support. One opposes. You oppose. Okay. Yeah. One oppose. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about that.